So our final speaker is Arthur Derveduve, who is a historian specializing in the history of media, news, and the book. He earned his PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where he's currently a postdoctoral research fellow. His first major project, for which he won three prizes, was the compilation of the first bibliography of 17th century Dutch newspapers, published by Brill in 2017. Current projects include a general history of the library to be published in 2021 and two forthcoming books, two forthcoming books, this is a busy young man, on the early history of newspaper advertising. His latest book, co-authored with Professor Andrew Pedigree, is the first comprehensive study of the book trade in the 17th century Dutch Republic, published this year by Yale. And it's called The Bookshop of the World, Making and Trading Books in the Dutch Golden Age. And we do have a few copies of it available for you as well. So, Arthur. Uh, Stephanie, many thanks for that very kind uh, introduction and, and thank you all uh, for coming here today, of course, and a big thanks to, to Max again for, for all the extremely smooth and efficient organization here. Um, now, we've heard a lot of nice things about Rembrandt, um, wonderful stories from some of his early years, but I would like to start here today at a real low point in Rembrandt's life, in 1656, when he's forced to declare bankruptcy. Now, by this point, Rembrandt had really fallen a long way, and an inventory was made um, of all the possessions left in his house. Now, this included a cornucopia of, um, of furniture, of artistic props, of uh, things like pikes and crossbows, um, of paintings, of course, but also of 22 books. Um, now, we know that the, the, um, what some of these books were. It included uh, Flavius Josephus's history, um, it included an old Bible, it included a book of German military drills, clearly something he might have used for some of his compositions, and also 15 unnamed large items. Um, and here, of course, on the right, one of his very early paintings, I think 1626, uh, and you see there in the bottom right a huge pile of books, and I think this is generally one of the ways in which he may have been using some of these. But really, when we think about these 22 books and Rembrandt around this time, that this, relatively speaking for Amsterdam, was a tiny library, and in some ways a fitting mark of his near destitution. For by this point, the Dutch Republic was a land that was absolutely teeming with books. Its publishers produced some of the most fabulous books of the age. And not only that, but in the 17th century, the Dutch published more books per capita than any other book-producing nation. For these reasons, it's all the more surprising that it's taken quite a long time for the, the true history of the book trade to be written in the Dutch Golden Age. And in a way, I don't want to don't lay blame here, but perhaps we've been dazzled a bit too much by the great Dutch painters of the era, and we seem to have overlooked the quieter revolution going on in the bourgeois homes of Dutch citizens. And this revolution was the way in which books and print were molding and reshaping Dutch society. Now, it is said that Dutch homes found space for perhaps three million paintings on their walls in this century. They certainly produced many more books, perhaps as many as 350 million. They traded at least four million of these books at auctions. Now, this is really the story that Andrew Pettigrew and I have tried to tell in, in the book here, The Bookshop of the World, as Stephanie said. You see here the English edition published by Yale and then the Dutch edition as well. But I would like to tell you that the title of this book is not the title that we envisaged. We originally called this book Trading Books in the Age of Rembrandt. And we thought this was a, a nice idea, a nice title. And um, both publishers of the English and the Dutch edition didn't like this at all. Uh, for different reasons. The Dutch publisher thought, liked Rembrandt, but they thought it might be sort of drowned out by all the other fantastic Rembrandt books there. So they wanted something different. Whereas Yale, and this is quite um, you know, a bit shamefaced to be honest, they said, well, it's not really clear, really, enough Rembrandt. I think people want to know what we're talking about when we're talking about Rembrandt. So you need something that, that forces us into the 17th century and into the Dutch Golden Age. So Rembrandt clearly not popular enough, which is surprising to me, and certainly, I mean, this audience here anyway. So Rembrandt is not in the title of the book, but because we had this title, we have written Rembrandt all throughout the book. So if you go to the book, in multiple chapters, we find Rembrandt uh, at his bankruptcy, we find him at uh, 
uh, Latin school, and of course we talk about education there. We find him in the world of prints, and we find him in the worlds of, uh, of business publishing and, and, and relating here predominantly to his debts. And of course, um, if we go to many Rembrandt paintings, we do find uh, a large number of items there. Having said that, we also use Rembrandt as a little bit of a departure because I think, at least relative to his peers in this period, I don't think Rembrandt was all too interested in books, especially later in his, in his career. And I think if you, if you compare it to some other artists, I would say that books are almost conspicuously absent from the entire oeuvre that he produced. But if books are present in his paintings, then they tend to be exactly the books which have always attracted most attention from scholars. And those are substantial, um, massive, and magnificent books. Books like these, like the, the wonderful um, 11, 12 volume Blau Atlas, truly one of the most um, significant publishing projects of this period. It's the largest atlas um, to be produced in this era. Now, these are the books that have often stood at the center of attention to what the Dutch could produce in this period. But a book like this would cost the equivalent of an annual salary um, for all but the most affluent citizens in the 17th century. And really what fueled the book trade in this period was a steady and recurring trade in the sort of books that might be careful and considered purchases of an, an artisan or a bourgeois household which would buy three or five books a year. And these were books they bought for use. A book for medical recipes to ensure the health of their household, a book on accounting to help their son to a better job, and most of all, books as part of their religious life. These sort of books tell us not only how the Dutch lived their lives, but who they actually were. But these, these humbler books are the books that have become almost invisible in the story of the Dutch Republic. And I would like to elaborate on that point a little bit today. And the reason for that is, is that these were generally books which were not destined for posterity. They were intended to be used every day or regularly and then worn out and replaced. Few of these books have made it through the centuries to take their place on the shelves of a library. And those that do survive are almost invariably the single surviving copy of a print run of 500, 800, maybe even 5,000. So this book that we wrote is partly an exercise in reversing this historical invisibility and provide more context on the true uh, extent of Dutch book production. For it's really these, these cheaper, humbler books that take us closest to understanding the heart and soul of the complex and contradictory society that is the Dutch Republic. Now, why was the potency of these smaller books not recognized on scholarship on the Dutch Republic? This is partly an issue that before the digital age, it was impossible to, to reconstruct quickly or relatively quickly, a corpus of surviving print that scattered around some 8,000 libraries and archives worldwide. And this is something that we've been trying to do at St. Andrews and reconstruct um, on a global scale uh, the holdings of early printed books and to compare records and thereby build up a far greater body of, of sources. Uh, generally, bibliographers say if they're looking at German books, they will look at German libraries, but not necessarily as much in libraries in other countries. So this is something we've been trying to do specifically for the Dutch Republic. But it also became very clear to us in an early stage that if we are to fathom this new book world, we could not rely solely on what survives today. We must also hunt for what we call lost books, books which were indeed printed and published in this period, but do not survive today. And I'm going to show you some of the techniques with which we've been doing that a little bit later. Now, why do many of these books not survive? Well, partly this is an issue of library collecting culture. Libraries, particularly the large scholarly libraries uh, visited uh, by, by historians, tend to collect a certain sort of book. Very often the books that professional men and serious collectors would most value, like those beautiful Blau Atlases, big, serious books of scholarship, often in scholarly languages. And this specifically excluded the sort of books favored by craftsmen and more humble bourgeois households when these were being produced. If we think of Sir Thomas Bodley, the uh, creator of the, of the famous uh, Bodleian Library in Oxford, when he founded this, he specifically forbade his librarian to accession what he described as idle books and riffraff. And by that he meant books in English. 
Now, this was much the same in uh, the lovely um, library of Leiden, which was specifically designed, really, for use by its professors to um, consult big, expensive reference works. Around the time that Rembrandt was um, a student at Leiden, the uh, library was not formally open to students. It was closed to students for a period for about 25 years. This was really a professorial uh, resource with almost no vernacular books, so books not in Latin or Greek or Hebrew or Arabic. Then again, um, the people who bought more humble books didn't take very good care of them either. Um, the sort of little religious texts, prayer books and catechisms or almanacs, these were all books that really made up the trade in this period, but they were books that were heavily used and then discarded. Um, just go chase a couple, one up here. Um, and this is, these, I've just run you through some of the examples that have been highlighted in our, in our story. There are books like this. On the right, you have a, um, a, a Dutch uh, school book, uh, a really horrible book. It's, it's called The Mirror of Youth in translation, which is a dialogue between a father and son about all the atrocities of the Dutch revolt. And it's got quite graphic, very cheap woodcuts all throughout, some of which are repeatedly used at totally random scenes. But this is an incredibly cheap book that would have been standard reading at all Dutch vernacular schools. And you see it's, I think this is the 15th impression, and we only have two other impressions before this, uh, surviving before this edition. On the left, you have a, a Dutch-French dictionary, and this is an extraordinary item held in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, um, which was part of a find of a Dutch naval expedition to find a northeast passage to the Indies in the late 16th century. And the sailors took with them Bibles and catechisms and also this dictionary. And when the expedition failed and they had to sail back, they left this behind. So this was found in the 19th century in Nova Zembla in the north of Russia in the little house that they had built and it's come back to, to the Rijksmuseum. Again, and this dictionary is the only surviving example of this entire print run of this, of this item. Then we've got catechisms, uh, again, very practical, very treasured practical books. We've got stories of the great, exciting uh, Dutch voyages of the period, um, which of course really, really sparked the imagination, as you can imagine, of, of, of many uh, young boys and girls um, of, of this time. Um, and an even more humbler, very um, daily um, pieces of print. On the left here, this is an incredibly common genre. On the left here, you see a wedding broadsheet. Now, this is a poem written by someone to celebrate a wedding of two, uh, two of their friends. Um, and it's printed just as a placard on a single side. And um, these were standard fare in the Dutch Republic. If you went to a wedding, well, these days we have a photographer. In the 17th century, you would have a wedding poem. Sometimes you would have three or four different ones. And there were specific writers who would um, produce hundreds of these throughout the period. But again, rarely they don't survive. And then another aspect of the Dutch print trade, an example on the left there, is really the, um, an incredibly competitive and dynamic uh, newspaper market. This was really the, the uh, period of the invention of newspaper, of newspaper advertising, um, and the Dutch had, had about 50 different newspapers in this particular period. But these two rarely survive. Now, with, a, with a, a sort of broader global perspective, we should not forget books which were destined for foreign audiences. Um, because in this period, Dutch books not only were produced for Dutch audiences, but for customers all across the European continent. And Dutch booksellers really dominated the international trade at this point. They had branches in Scandinavia and Germany, and some publishers catered exclusively for this market, often in, in religious texts, like on the left-hand side here. This is a, a Hungarian edition of the Psalms. Uh, printed in Amsterdam, and on the right you have a German Lutheran Bible specifically produced for the market in uh, what is now roughly Prussia and, and northern Germany. Now these sort of books, again, they don't tend to survive in Dutch libraries, but they do tend to survive in libraries in Germany and Hungary, etc. But we also begin to, to touch here on a little bit of a, of a paradox that's, that's playing here. Um, and it's that the fact that some of the books in our great libraries survive so well because, um, precisely because they were not much read. And in a way, it, it's, a, it's a strange paradox that the books that were most valued by owners in this period have often survived least well today. Then there is a second paradox that I would like to talk about, and that's the fact that the books that made reputations in this period were not necessarily the books that made publishers a lot of money. 
Dutch publishers were so successful in conquering international markets precisely because they, they chose not to publish certain books. So the, uh, you never see sort of great Latin legal works being printed in the Dutch Republic because there was a market that was absolutely swamped by editions from Lyon, by editions from Venice or southern Germany. So what the Dutch did, they bought these books cheaply abroad, took them to Amsterdam and Leiden, and then re-exported them at higher prices. And it's just the way, the way they, they, they worked in the market for whale blubber, they did the exact same thing with them in books. It's just another commodity. And one particular family captures this, this paradox really well, and that's the Elsevier family of Leiden and Amsterdam, which is founded by a guy called Louis Elsevier, who arrives in Leiden in 1580, practically bankrupt. Uh, but he quickly begins to sell books to the university professors and develops a relationship with them, and he starts to make some money then. And he establishes dynasty that really dominates the international trade in the Dutch Republic. Elsevier is most famous for publishing Galileo, on the left here, their example, when his publications were forbidden in Italy, for publishing the likes of Balzac, you have there on the right, and for publishing Descartes. But what we also know is that the Elsevier's were extremely tight with their authors um, and always drove an incredibly hard bargain. And they drove the hardest bargain of all with, the pub with um, um, some very young authors, and those were Leiden University students who had to publish um, their um, disputations at the university, often um, several a year as they were practicing and leading up to their promotion. Um, and the Elsevier's could set particular prices because they had a monopoly on these particular dissertations. So there were many complaints about both the quality of the printing for these um, and the high rates that they set. But this is really where the Elsevier's made most of their money. But the reason this hasn't been recognized is because only about 15% of all the dissertations originally published have no longer survived today. So if Rembrandt was defending um, a disputation when he was a student, which is certainly possible, it has not survived. But we shouldn't say that's particularly unusual. Now, the Elsevier has also made a big market in the, um, the trade in, um, in Latin classics, uh, small format Latin books, which were, um, as, as we've heard before, in the Latin school, these were um, um, essential reading. So again, you have a, a large captive market with students who constantly need books. And as we know, students often throw away books. So this is a market where you constantly need new editions. Um, so that's another aspect of, of that. Um, and finally, the Elsevier has also made a particular claim to fame by being some of the very first uh, booksellers to hold specific book auctions and publish printed auction catalogues of these sales. And on the left ex uh, side here, you have the earliest printed auction catalog uh, in the world. This is the catalog of the books of the Dutch uh, statesman Philipson Marnix, which was auctioned in Leiden in 1599. Now, the auction market was a big boon for, for the Dutch book trade. Um, because it injected a certain cash flow in the business. This was a society in which um, credit and book exchange, so selling books for other books, was the main um, means of trade. But in auctions, you had to pay cash. So this was a very welcome injection for many booksellers. But it also promoted collecting, and it promoted the growth of personal uh, libraries. Because as soon as people realized that they could invest in books, that is, they could build up a library, say, of a thousand items, but comfort comfortable in the knowledge that when they died, their heirs could then sell their library and make a decent return on all that investments. So libraries were both practical, but they were also a relatively safe bet. And this is really what we see uh, starting in the 17th century. We know of, of over 4,000 book auctions that took place during this period, all with, with printed catalogues like these. But these catalogues also provide an, a glimpse um, into, into another paradox, if not some of the hypocrisy of Dutch bookselling business. Now, like most early modern countries, the Dutch Republic had a system of book censorship, forbidding the printing of uh, subversive and unorthodox religious works, uh, which you were not allowed to print, um, buy, or sell. But then again, if we look at some of these auction catalogues, we start to find things like this, which are specific sections in the, in the auction catalogues of libri prohibiti, or forbidden books. So these were separately marketed to an audience to say, this is, the real, this is really the good stuff. This is what you want to buy. And this just went on happily ever after. While the, the magistrates of Leiden were the first to ban uh, the publications of Spinoza in the Dutch Republic, 
Um, Leiden was also the town where almost all auctions with Libri Prohibiti were held, including from some libraries owned by Leiden's magistrates. So it's, it's, it's a funny world. You have, to, you, have to, you have to be careful. These auction catalogues also allow us to, to reconstruct um, the, the corpus of books published in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. Um, and from, from many of these catalogues and other contemporary references, uh, Andrew and I and our team in St. Andrews have, have now accumulated references to almost half a million books sold at auction or marketed for sale in catalogues in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. Um, now this, is, this provides us with really interesting material because we, we can compare this to the corpus of books that we know of that does survive and find some of these lost books, some of these lost items. This, uh, I should say this also involves the use of, of newspaper advertisements, which when they are first introduced in the Netherlands are almost exclusively for uh, announcements for newly published books. And I'll just show you a couple of um, examples. Oh, well, this, is, this is very neat too. Um, obviously this is a beautiful, gorgeous uh, Dutch still life uh, you see here, a wonderful spread of delicacies you could, you could uh, eat in the 17th century. Uh, but if we look very closely, there's also a book here does anyone see it? Does that help? This is a title page of an Amsterdam almanac, which is being reused as a pepper cone. <laughs> um, and as you can see here, the detail on the almanac is fantastic, uh, really precise. You've got the beautiful coat of arms that you can just make out. Uh, and, a, and a nice red and black double printing. And we specifically know that this was a widespread use because we have a reference from uh, Pierre Bayle, the French philosopher, when he, he's insulting about a, a fellow scholar's publication. He says, oh, I tried to get this guy's book, but it's so bad that all the copies have already been sold to the, the spice sellers to be rolled up into little <laughs> rolls. So this was a common practice. I'll give, you, I'll give you one example um, here, and that is the example of a, an extremely popular a devotional work by a Lutheran minister called Johann Habermann, translated into Dutch. Um, this was really for the Lutheran community in the Netherlands, very popular book. These are three surviving examples, including this lovely, in the center, this lovely heart-shaped book, which is a real, a real rarity to see it like that, Christian prayers. So we know of 11 surviving editions of Habermann's works printed in the Dutch Republic in this period. But we have found another 47 in catalogues and then another eight lost editions in newspaper advertisements. So from 11, we have gone to 66 different editions. And this is really how you can transform what you know of particular popularity of authors and therefore also of their, of their, the relatively, of their use within Dutch society. And we can do this for, for, for multiple uh, different sorts of texts, but generally it concerns religious works. In my conclusion, I just want to return to, to the city of Leiden. Um, and a few years ago, I came across a, a very interesting source in the archive of the city, which, and this revealed the instruction of the magistrates of Leiden to their town criers. These were the individuals who were charged with proclaiming the law um, and who could also be um, employed by citizens to make announcements. So you've lost your dog, uh, your child's run away, you would go to the town criers of Leiden to go out on the streets and make this news uh, no. And here again, we have lovely um, bird's eye view of Leiden. And these are the 51 locations in red dots where the town criers had to make their announcements. Um, so first of all, this is just interesting to see in terms of the, the cityscape, you know, where do they have to go? They're generally proclaiming on bridges, which particularly carry voices, of course, quite well. Um, and it gives you some sense to what extent the magistrates of the city were also involved in, in engaging with their, with their public, with their community in this particular period. But what is also interesting um, is the fact that in, 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 all, in, in all Dutch cities, and this is a, a unique thing in this period compared to other countries, these town criers would also have been carrying with them bundles of printed posters and printed flyers which they would post up at these locations in their wake so that people could then, if they had missed the announcement, it would be posted up there uh, for them to read. And Leiden was actually one of the first cities where the municipality was really determined to make sure that all their communications were printed. After the siege of Leiden, they actually set up a press in the city hall, the Raadhuispers, where they produced documents like this. One is on the left here is a 
a receipt to a citizen who has contributed a forced loan to the, um, to, to the war fund to help fight the Spaniards. And on the right, you have a, uh, a regulation of the guild of the butchers of Leiden. So these, these range really from the high political to the, the really the, um, the mundane uh, regulations of the city. But these are absolutely crucial documents because they, in a way, are some of the prints that I think affect the daily lives of citizens to the greatest extent. Now, Rembrandt, too, had personal experiences with such humble notices. And here, you have the note, printed notice of his bankruptcy, bankruptcy sale from 1656, which would have been plastered all over Amsterdam. And you have here, also crucially, uh, to think about the interaction between print and oral communication. On the, on the bottom here, you have the Dutch phrase, zeg het voort, pass on the word. If you start to look in Dutch paintings of the period, you also start to see uh, these posters were truly everywhere. Here's two examples, one from the Bourse in Amsterdam, the financial heart of the city, and if you look in the top, see if I can get my pointer, posters all over here, posters up on that wall there, and here we go to the, uh, the Toll House in Amsterdam. If you come out of the set train station in Amsterdam, this would have been roughly in that, in that location, and again, this is where all incoming ships would pay their toll dues, and they would share information, so this was a real hub where lots of printed posters would be found. So if we start to think of these cities as constantly being plastered by print, you start to see how ubiquitous this is and how important it is for all these printers also to stay in business. So finally, if anyone ever questions why some of these little books or, or, or ephemeral posters matter, then we only need to consider what I think, in my opinion, is the, the most influential book of the Dutch Golden Age. And this is a very little book. It's a small quarter pamphlet or 40, roughly 40 pages, printed in The Hague, and interestingly enough, printed in English. Now this is the declaration of Prince William III of Orange, in which he justifies his invasion of England. Now, this pamphlet was printed in advance of the invasion of 1688, and it was printed in total secrecy. It was, however, printed in a massive print run. He printed over 50,000 copies of this in English to take with him with the Armada, so that once they arrived in England, they could distribute it around to justify this military invasion. And there's this wonderful exchange between um, the English ambassador in The Hague and King James uh, the second and, and, and seventh uh, of England and Scotland, where James says, you must get this declaration. We must know what, what, what it says so we can start a response before the invasion has happened. And so the ambassador here says, you know, I'm really trying my best. I'm trying to get to this declaration. But the printer of the states, because they're paid so well by the authorities, are not to be corrupted. I can't bribe them. And I've even seen if his, some of his servants can be bribed, but they too... Um, uh, will, not, will not endanger their lucrative places in this business. And he says, I will leave no stone unmoved. And then there's another letter a week later where he says, no, I'm sorry, I really couldn't get, get hold of a copy. <laughs> it gets even worse, too, because when James finally has a copy, when William has already set sail, he reads and he's so angry, he throws it in the fireplace. And then he, he needs to get a second copy because he forgot what it says. So he, he has to borrow a princess, uh, princess Anne's copy. So it just, it's a total disaster. Um, but really, you know, this little book that played a significant role in the, in the formulation of the English Bill of Rights of 1689, it was direct passages were cited from this to say, this is what William said when he invaded, so this will be our constitution. And really with that bill, I think we see the, the true formation of, of modern Western political democracy. And that change, I think, was the, was the achievement of an, a century long of Dutch experiments and experience in the world of books and printing. And in that sense, it was a, uh, it's a testament to the, to the power of, of the press and the influence of the book on the culture of the 17th century. Thank you.